We have an unidentified flying object. Good evening, my fellow Americans. The sighting over Washington yesterday has alarmed many of you. However, please, do not... We close? Yeah, we're close. 2001 was a real space odyssey for me. Instead of flying on a spaceship to the moon, Jupiter, or beyond the solar system, I met Dan Aykroyd for the first time to talk about UFOs. That's when I knew I had to sit him down in front of a camera and just let him talk about the truth. Because if I didn't, no one would believe we had this amazing conversation. And one time I had this long conversation with Dan Aykroyd about UFOs and I thought it was like Einstein was hiding inside of a comic genius, just so that if he told us the real truth, you wouldn't have to believe it. If Einstein had told us UFOs were real, would we have believed him? He never spoke about it. But Dan Aykroyd speaks about UFOs as if he were a full professor on the subject. So Dan, how did you, you know, how did you get started in UFOs? What, what sparked your interest? What was the first thing that, that you can remember that happened to you that made you, uh, you know, ponder the question? Well, I was born in July 1952. And uh, I guess about, uh, maybe when I was eight years old I found a magazine a life magazine with a picture of the UFOs from that sighting on the cover uh, with a big inquiry uh, you know what what are these UFOs and uh, so that kinda of started it as a kid and I asked my parents about it and you know they actually you know couldn't tell me what they were because they didn't know they knew there was some mystery there then I saw the day the, the earth stood still as a, as a kid and uh, I mean, that was a, a film that directly related to maybe some of the motives for visitations from other planets. Um, and it certainly seems accurate today if you look at the way mankind in the last hundred years has basically started to turn this planet into a cinder. Uh, three, four holes in the ozone layer because of industrial production around the world, uh, nuclear testing wars. Uh, I, I'm just sure that just in theory if there were another species in the universe monitoring us or near us they would be very interested in what we're doing to this planet to this planet's atmosphere and to uh, possibly neighboring bodies so there would be a, a concern there and uh, I think that in terms of the extraterrestrial machines that are coming and going that may be maybe a part of their motivation We've just had a rash of sightings all over the planet, and we've got Iran and Turkey and Mexico. I mean, it seems like we're being invaded by UFOs. Um, let's talk first just about what's actually happening out there. Well, recently, uh, the most dynamic sighting that we've, we've seen, because it's corroborated by an actual government, is the, uh, the sighting that took place over Mexico recently, where a uh, drug surveillance uh, twin-engine turboprop plane was at altitude... Uh, taking pictures of possible smuggling routes and um, they photograph with their infrared cameras 11 uh, unidentified objects. Uh, some of them were in pairs and in threes and uh, of course you know these were objects that couldn't be seen by the naked eye but were visible on the infrared cameras. Well the United States Air Force after the, uh, the news appeared in in America, and it was covered on CNN and Fox. The footage was shown on Fox. It was shown on CNN, and in the Valley Daily News on the front page, it had a big headline: UFOs with a question mark, and it had pictures from that sighting. And of course, the United States Air Force had to respond, and they uh, said it was uh, swamp gas. Uh, so I don't know whether swamp gas is not visible uh, to the naked eye and visible on infrared, whether it comes in multiple balls whether swamp gas is capable of doing a complete circuit around an aircraft and then taking off at high speed and right angles into the sky. If it is, then maybe it was swamp gas. But uh, somehow, this is, seems to be a legitimate one because 
the Mexican government uh, decided that we want to release this to the world. And this follows on the heels of the, the Belgian general who uh, revealed uh, some F-15 uh, footage years ago uh, of his Air Force planes chasing objects that were uh, exceeding them uh, in speed by, by twice again what, uh, what his planes were going at. Uh, the French government, uh, over the last couple of years, has released a comprehensive study on the UFOs. The Soviets have been, uh, since the 1950s, engaged in numerous studies uh, about landings, abductions, uh, and, and, and the sightings. So we do have legitimate government inquiry going on. And in fact, as anyone in the field knows, the United States government for years has been covering uh, this issue um, because they were compelled to cover it because of uh, Ken Arnold's sighting, because of the sighting over Washington in July 52, just after I was born, the famous shot of the, the V-shaped lights over the Capitol and over the Coast Guard, Guard station. Um, so the government uh, initiated originally, I believe it was, uh, well, it was, there were Project Sign, Project Grudge, the Condon Report, Project Blue Book, and then they engaged uh, J. Allen Hynek. So, uh, you know, the French, Belgian, Mexican, Iranian, and Turkish governments are not the only ones who address this issue. Our good old USA government has, in fact, seen uh, the necessity to put people's fears or concerns at rest. And uh, as anybody in the field knows, these studies went on, and, and these uh, studies revealed that, you know, most of the uh, sightings could be explained through conventional means. Uh, as either hoaxes or weather climactic things, uh, climatic things, but many of uh, the sightings were were unexplained, and so therein is where where lies where lies the mystery in all of this. Uh, Dan, what do you think is the significance of, of UFO technology? I mean, obviously these guys, um, the extraterrestrials, can come from one star system to another and visit Earth. I mean. Recent headlines on CNN are talking about and BBC that we're going to run out of oil in 2026. We've got to get on to a better technology. I mean, to be able to go from another star system to Earth, obviously they have the answer. Well, the, <clears throat> the presence of these obviously intelligently controlled machines uh, tells us that we are dealing with beings who have uh, anywhere from a thousand to a million, to 10 million, to a billion years advancement uh, in technology on us. So you've got to figure that, <clears throat> look, look what happened in the last hundred years. We have the Wright brothers in, at the turn of the century taking off in basically a fabric and wood aircraft. By 1969, we have uh, lunar expeditions. In the year 2004, we have massive airplanes being built out of uh, alloys and uh, Graphite and these, this big ship that Air, Airbus is building, the new Boeing plane. So in a hundred years, from fabric and wood, we've come to, you know, advanced metallurgy, uh, fuel use, and propulsion in just a hundred years. Imagine what a culture could accomplish in a thousand years, or uh, ten thousand years, or a million years, or a billion years. It's not inconceivable that you have intelligently manufactured and controlled machines that can not only traverse great distances in space by uh, mastering gravity and the time-space continuum, but also the dimensional, the interdimensional travel that might be possible. Many theories now purport that uh, there were not only four dimensions at the creation of the entire multiverse 14 billion years ago at the time of the Big Bang, there were 11, maybe as many as 21 dimensions. So some of these beings may be coming from, from an extra dimensional uh, place. I mean, and you know, what it says is that these technologies uh, have been harnessed and that it's possible to use other fuels uh, that uh, don't rely just on, on simple combustion. And, you know, there are many theories. I mean, some theories are that the military already knows about these, uh, these forms of uh, propulsion and, uh, and lighter-than-air vehicles or, or metals that can be uh, vibrated to a certain point where they, they become uh, 
they become light waves, uh, photons. But they're not telling us. They're not going to reveal that, obviously, to us. And we just have to keep keep the search going. So I, I think that uh, you know it's incumbent on on us as a race on this planet to begin to find alternatives to the to the fossil fuels. Um, but we're just not doing it fast enough. It's probably been the greatest and most successful cover-up in the history of the world. UFOs are as real as the airplanes that fly over your head. That is my unequivocal conclusion. Oh my God. The Avro Arrow story, Dan, I mean, you appeared in a movie about the Avro Arrow story. Um, Canada broke the sound barrier. Diefenbaker dismantles the whole uh, aerospace program in Canada, and um, all the engineers are hired by NASA and Boeing down here, and we finally break the sound barrier. But in Canada today, we have another scientist, uh, Canadian scientist John Hutchison, is in using wave induction, using Van de Graaff and Tesla coils and radio, on a 75-pound cannonball, we can see this huge cannonball levitating in the air. I mean, um, Boeing, NASA, Lockheed, all of these defense contractors are going up into his lab in Canada and trying to understand how this thing works because the next person or the next country that figures out true anti-gravity propulsion systems um, is, going to be, is going to be king of aerospace on this planet. The Hutchison Effect incorporates radio frequencies, Tesla frequencies, and high electrostatic energy to create a type of levitation effect where it can move a 75 pound cannonball of steel or brass bushings, water, wood, and other objects into the air. Are we doing enough in our universities, in our in our uh, research labs, are we putting enough money into this kind of a research and what risks are we willing to take if universities in Beijing and China and, and Russia, they're actually going into the, uh, the UFO phenomenon or universities, but here in America, mainstream science, mainstream physicists laugh at the UFO phenomena. I mean, what do you think about that? Budgets are tight all around the world and it, as far as putting money into the study of alternative technologies, of funding, uh, research by people like Hutchinson, uh, the money is just not there. I mean, if you look at NASA, NASA is getting chopped back <clears throat> um, because uh, the funds that are, are, are flowing through government now are focused on the war in Iraq and, and other things. So we don't even have the money to keep up conventional uh, space exploration, uh, development of metallurgy, fuels, ion drive systems. So I don't see any government in the next, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years really uh, putting the money into uh, the kind of research that's, that's needed to develop these alternative systems and to perhaps study what is driving these intelligent machines from, from somewhere else. Uh, now, <clears throat> of course, that, that's on the, on the, the visible side of things. <clears throat> We're hearing a lot about these special access programs where congressional money is approved by a very narrow uh, slice of the membership in the legislature and given to the military to do basically carte blanche what they want with. So there could be a black military program that is producing um, what, uh, what people are referring to now as the, the big black deltas which are these huge black triangles that uh, are being seen all around the world. The big black rectangles, which are also being seen all around the world. So maybe, <clears throat> maybe they look a little like this. The F-117, they look a little like the, B, uh, the B-2 uh, bomber. Um, maybe these uh, are special access programs that have been applied to alternative technology and energy and are really practically at work today. But I don't see... Uh, them revealing, you know, these uh, the sources of these programs, nor their applications right now. Okay, I worked in the U.S. space program for 36 years, 
I was a contractor employee, first working for McDonnell Douglas and then ending up working for Boeing after McDonnell Douglas was purchased by Boeing. Uh, I started at the end of the Mercury program and then worked the whole Gemini program. And during Gemini, I was responsible for the design of the equipment uh, for the life support system. And so I had a distinct interest in keeping astronauts alive and having successful equipment. Uh, during the program, when uh, we were flying the Gemini spacecraft, uh, my interest in UFOs became very real. It became real because, first of all, Gemini 2, which was unmanned, it was rumored uh, and talked about among our researchers that uh, uh, two UFOs had followed Gemini 2. And then uh, Gemini 2, of course, recovered later. And I didn't think too much about that except, yeah, that's kind of funny. Uh, very interesting stuff. And then when Gemini 4 flew and... Uh, it's four-day mission, 66 orbits, with James McDivitt and Ed White. Uh, about halfway through the mission, McDivitt said he has something up here with him. Astronaut Gordon Cooper is an American hero with a log of over 222 hours of manned spaceflight. He had a long and illustrious career of service to his country. With over 11,000 hours of flight, he was a fighter pilot, U-2 test pilot in the Air Force, and is one of the first men to ever fly in space. He orbited the Earth 22 times in Phase 7, the last of the Mercury missions, on May 15th and 16th of 1963. On August 21st of 1965, he orbited the Earth again on Gemini 5 and remained a backup for Apollo 10. Well, I, I've had uh, some occasions to know some of the people who were involved in Roswell at one stage or the other. I think there's been an awful lot of untruths put out on Roswell and an awful lot of conjecture. I think there have been some truths in it. I think definitely there was something other than a weather blame there. Very likely. I'd like to think they reversed engineered it and did something with it. You know, did some benefit with it, which would be the logical thing to do, but I have no way of knowing whether they did or not. Within hours of the crash of Roswell, U.S. General Nathan Twyman designated the, vision, the visitors rather, as enemy aliens. It appears from his book, Colonel Corso agreed with that assessment and that it has remained as official U.S. policy ever since. At that time, however, it was an enemy, quote-unquote, about which the U.S. could do nothing because the visitors were so technologically superior. That led to the recommendation that the discovery be treated with the utmost secrecy to the point that the crash of Roswell didn't happen and that UFOs don't exist. The rationale was that the ordinary public couldn't cope with the news and might easily panic. Uh, Area 51, Dan, I mean, we hear stories from Bob Lazar, we hear stories about alternative space program theories, you know, we're building UFOs and reverse engineering UFO technology since the, cr the saucers crashed at Roswell and the plains of St. Augustine, and we have reverse engineered that technology today. That's the theory, and NASA is just a smokescreen program. If we really have true anti-gravity technology today, why aren't we using it in our military? Why isn't it evident uh, in the war in Iraq? Why don't we use it to, to demonstrate superiority on the planet? And if not, if, if all of this is just conspiracy theory and we really don't have this technology, um, again, are we willing to take the risk of losing air superiority on this planet by letting the Russians or the Chinese um, and, or some other country, even the Middle East, um, actually engineer this kind of UFO technology and, and conquer the world? Are we willing to take that chance? Well, I think, uh, I, I, again, I, as far as military applications, uh, maybe, they're, maybe they are being used already. Maybe uh, 
we don't, you know, we don't know. Maybe they're being used in a surveillance capacity. Um, as far as um, you know, weapons that could be associated with uh, with such uh, vehicles, one would have to think that if the propulsion system uh, is as sophisticated as it would need to be to have these vehicles just hover, stop, uh, noiselessly uh, take off at right angles, uh, do three to five to six to twenty thousand miles an hour, one would think that the the military application uh, would then take the form of rather than rockets and uh, and uh, projectiles uh, that probably a, a particle beam uh, would would be used, some kind of a, a laser, some kind of a, a and a disabling beam to disable equipment to uh, cause disorientation among men and troops. And of course we have seen no, no evidence of this. <clears throat> I'm not sure that uh, the U.S. military would want to play that card right now because after all the war in Iraq really is a conventional war. We have air superiority there already. Um, there is no Iraqi Air Force. There was no Iraqi Air Force. We in the United States uh, we have air superiority basically over the rest of the world. I'm sure there's some pretty hot shot MiG pilots in, in China and Russia. Um, but uh, I think if you put our air force up against any air force on this planet, we would prevail without the use of, uh, of advanced uh, technology of the type, type we're speaking of. So um, I think that uh, the U.S., if they have these things, they would probably save them for... A, um, a more drastic confrontation, uh, perhaps a confrontation with um, beings that have the potential to uh, be superior uh, over us in terms of uh, the applications of, of, of aviation today. So maybe these triangles, the big black deltas, the rectangles, are the next wave of the U.S. military's defense against what some might perceive as an extraterrestrial or extra dimensional threat. Maybe these weapons or these flight systems now are being prepared to confront um, a race of superior beings that, uh, that could have designs on the planet that are malevolent. Uh, you know, uh, I, I believe, I, I think it was Lord Hill Norton or one of the British Air Force uh, Defense Ministry staff who was assigned to study UFOs in the 50s, after he retired, he said that in his estimation there were 23 different species of being visiting, visiting the planet in, in, you know, numerous types of vessels. Um, we know from the, uh, the NASA UFO studies that, that, that you've done, uh, when I, and I think that that theory, you know, there's, there, there's nothing wrong with that, that theory that I, that I can see that doesn't point to what, what you postulate, and that is that there are benevolent beings that are trying to heal the planet, hence the, 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 the size of these ships that were seen in the STS uh, cameras, uh, and uh, the fact that the ozone has holes in it, the fact that water could be a healing element there. Uh, what are these, uh, these lifesaver-shaped little dropostone-shaped ships conveying to our planet? Well. You know, uh, we see them coming into the atmosphere and uh, uh, on, on the STS tapes and, and other camp forms of, uh, of exposure. They're not releasing uh, personnel. They're not releasing projectiles. And um, no harm has come to the planet, um, you know, through their intervention. So one, one can assume perhaps that maybe there are benevolent beings out there and malevolent beings out there. And maybe the United States government is preparing uh, weapon systems to deal with the malevolent beings. Ronald Reagan <clears throat> said in a speech, he said, what if there were a species from another planet that was threatening us? We would all find a way to work together. And one can only think about the Star Wars system and the fact that there we had uh, satellite-mounted cannon. Well, they'd be good for shooting down rockets. They also might be good for shooting down uh, other uh, invasive vehicles that are coming into our, our, our atmosphere. Ronald Reagan himself spoke about a UFO sighting that he had when he was governor of California in the Beach King Air that they used to use. Uh, they were coming from Sacramento. His wife was with him, uh, Sacramento to, um, to Los Angeles, and uh, a saucer clocked the, the plane for a good 45 minutes. And Reagan uh, spoke of it to, to a lot of people. Um, 
And I think uh, maybe, you know, part of his motivation in getting the, the uh, Star Wars weapon system up might have been that to prepare ourselves for the day when uh, other beings might, might come to this planet with designs of, who knows, taking minerals without authorization, taking people. Uh, you know, we, uh, we'll, we'll, we're probably just going to have to wait to see. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Colonel Corso makes it clear that the Reagan administration's strategic defense initiative, appropriately dubbed Star Wars, was primarily designed for use against the alien intruders. His contemporary successor, the anti-missile missile defense system, is also being designed with that as one of its principal objectives. It is true that a case can be made for attempting to provide a shield against the Russians and Chinese, although everyone knows that the Russians are not going to embark on a policy which would result in their total destruction. It is equally true that they, too, are aware of the visitors and know that the perceived threat from the visitors has been a major consideration in the planning of the anti-missile system. And the incident in question, um, as at least from my perspective, uh, almost ignited uh, a nuclear war, and that was uh, five unidentified objects were uh, picked up on radar coming in over the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Northern California, uh, Southern Washington, Oregon uh, area. Uh, as these objects approached the uh, coast, uh, Strategic Air Command went on a um, uh, alert. Uh, we were in a defense condition, or what is referred to as a DEFCON um, de defense condition three, which means that the nuclear forces were ready, but they weren't on a ready stated alert. Now uh, we elevated that to uh, defense condition four. Defense condition five is launch. When we went on our alert, the Russians were also monitoring our nuclear armed forces as we were theirs. And so they knew that our bombers had gone to fail safe. They knew that the launch codes had been given. They also knew that the hatches on the ICBM missiles had been removed and that we were getting ready to do a, uh, a launch. Uh, I know that Nixon, uh, President Richard Milhouse Nixon, picked up the phone and called the Kremlin. The White House notified the Kremlin that these objects were not, and I repeat, not a uh, preemptive launch by us, that uh, they too, the Russians, uh, had been tracking these objects as they came in over the Bering Sea. Probably moved a hundred miles in a matter of a second or two. When we look at alien abduction, I mean the idea of a, of a human being being taken and uh, having an implant inserted into their body, um, I often think of how biologists, um, how we tag whales, you know, we put a, a chip on a whale and we can track them via satellite, and also how, you know, we go into a, a frog's pond and we pull out the frog and we spread it out on the table. Remember in biology class we used to do this and you know stick the little needles in his legs and cut them open. I mean that's how we look at um, an, another life form in another world. So is it really a sign of violence uh, and negativity that an extraterrestrial civilization is coming to earth and doing the same to us? Putting computer chip implants on us to track us, know where we are, study our species, do a little bit of biological experimentation. I mean, I know for us it's horrific. I mean, it's absolutely a violent thing for us as humans. But from their perspective, do you really think that they're being violent? Well, again, I, I have to go back to some of them might be here for good purposes, uh, genuinely interested in, in perhaps helping man mankind, and some are here for selfish purposes. Maybe these abductions, even though uh, they're uh, done in a, in a, in a you know, objective but uh, you know, biological way, 
like we dissect frogs. Um, maybe uh, maybe they're they're doing it, you know, just for fun and for sport. I mean, I I, I don't know. I I th I think probably that uh, uh, that the fear uh, could be could be justified in some senses. And Druffle uh, has written this book about how to uh, prevent being abducted. And you really think, even, even if benevolent species coming to this planet and taking a man and a woman and taking ova out of a woman and sperm out of a man, that's tremendously invasive uh, and very traumatic for the human beings. Um, so in, even if the motives are good, you know, the, these, these, these actions are, are as violent as, uh, as, as anyone we're cap capable of on, on the planet. Um, I think that a certain amount of fear is is justified. If you look at Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, you know the first thing that uh, that happens is the army is assembled and you know guns are shot at the at these at these beings and at the ship. because I say the most important question to put to any high-ranking official is not what you think about UFOs or have you seen one. The, the more, most important question is have you ever been briefed on the subject? Did someone walk in your office and tell you what's going on? Because if someone walks into the president's office or some high-ranking official and briefs him on the subject of UFOs, it is for real. It's not imaginary as the government has been saying for 60 years. So I asked uh, Mr. Cheney, this is three months after he became the vice president, I asked him on the air, and this is still on Diane Reem's archives, Mr. Cheney and all your jobs in government, have you ever been briefed on the subject of UFOs? And if so, when was it and what were you told? And Mr. Cheney said, if I had been briefed on that subject, it probably would have been classified and I wouldn't be talking about it. January 22nd, 1997, I noticed three amber orbs now at a distance far west on the horizon. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, even though they're in a line formation, they were amber, they were in a formation, they were hovering for minutes. And as I'm pointing like this, they reappear in the same spot. And I thought, I have to get a picture of this. And I ran upstairs, I grabbed my 35 millimeter, get out onto the balcony. As I'm ready to shoot the three bottom orbs, suddenly six amber orbs in a row, totally equidistant from each other, massive span across, pop up. On March 13th, 1997, over 10,000 Arizona residents witnessed the single most spectacular UFO sighting in the 20th century. Headlines surged the nation and Arizona residents demanded answers from military and state officials. A mile-wide UFO was seen from as far north as Flagstaff, Arizona, and then the giant triangular UFO hovered above the great city of Phoenix, Arizona, where Dr. Lynn Kitai shot this amazing videotape. When we go out into space and we're exploring the cosmos out there and we're looking for signs of extraterrestrial life, what kind of a, of a uh, communication are we going to send out? I mean, if Dan Aykroyd was the ambassador, if you were the ambassador for Earth, what message would you teletype to E.T.? If I were to speak for mankind to these beings that were, were coming here, um, <clears throat> I guess what I would say is, you know, let's go to some neutral place. Um, let's have a meeting with scientists from all around the world, world leaders. Let's sit down and, 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 and basically have a sort of a forum with, with you, the, the extraterrestrial or extra dimensional beings. Let's, let, let's sit down and, and kind of get to know each other. And, um, you know, human instinct is pretty good. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it would almost like be a sort of a G8 style kind of summit with world leaders, scientific leaders, and these these beings. And you'd sit down with them, and you know, after about a week, 
uh, or even a couple of days or maybe a few hours, you would really sort of get a sense of what of what they're up to. But of course, you know, childhood's end, Arthur C. Clarke's great story. Uh, it looked like these beings were, were benevolent, even though they had an, a malevolent appearance. And in the end, we find out that they they meant no good for our for our planet. So I, you know, I mean, I think it's important that uh, some branches of the military and police uh, be be briefed on these uh, uh, in, in a very real sense and be told, you know, they are real. People are being abducted. There is mind control in play here and that we do have to be vigilant now. If we knew that there was a purely benevolent race, like if uh, something happened in Iraq where all of the electronics went out in the American military and uh, all of the insurgents' uh, rifles jammed, uh, or uh, we saw all of the uh, polluted uh, waters in North Carolina from the pig farming completely healed overnight, and different signs like this, then we would know we're dealing with a benevolent species, and then we could really be open and welcome. Uh, but then again, we would have to be cautious because beings with that much power could give the impression that they're here to help when really they're not. So the verdict is out on all this. We, we just don't know which ones are benevolent, which are, ones are malevolent, and the degree to which uh, they're going to continue um, interacting with our planet. But what would really help is if the United States military and police and government o open it up to their staffs and say, Look, this is something we really do have to consider uh, because, you know, maybe the defense, the survival of our species could, could well be at stake. If you look at the history, you know, from, say, Ken Arnold's first sighting in 47, going back to the Bible, Ezekiel's wheel, going back to the medieval manifestations of little saucers and, and, and UFOs, that painting of the Madonna that's very famous uh, in which it appears up to now. Um, there has been no, there have been no mass murders by these, these beings, there's been no mass destruction of cities, but hundreds of thousands of people have been taken out of their lives, subjected to surgical um, uh, experimentation, released back into the population and are suffering trauma today for it. That is, is not good. The idea, I mean, like in the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the meeting on the dark side of the moon in Devil's Tower, Wyoming, I mean, it seems like the logical thing to do. I mean, we, we, uh, we have a communication, a teletype message. We have a place, a location, and a time, and we isolate it from the public until we know it's safe. I mean, we, we check each other out. I mean, this seems like the most logical thing to do, you know, even rather than meeting on the White House lawn. I mean, this is the way we would like it to happen. But that doesn't seem to be the way it's really happening. I mean, these extraterrestrials don't seem to be so interested in doing things politically the way we do things on Earth. They're picking certain individuals to contact. They are uh, zeroing in on those individuals. But now, I mean, there are so many sightings going on all over the planet. I mean, uh, it's just amazing. I mean, Iran, Turkey, Mexico, uh, Venice, California, um, Sonora, California, Texas, Death Valley. I mean, the reports are coming in every other day now. Um, it seems like we're heading towards an omega point. I mean, uh, what is about to happen? I mean, is this, is this all just a coincidence that, that more and more people have video cameras? Or do you really think, you know, there's a, a major unprecedented uh, communication that is about to happen between our extraterrestrial visitors and humanity? Or again, is it, is it the video camera question? More, more camcorders? There are definitely more video cameras out there, um, and uh, definitely more sightings, and definitely more credible witnesses. You know, the biggest thing in ufology uh, in the 60s was uh, Herb Shermer, the Nebraska Highway Patrolman, who was at the Ashland Oil uh, tank farm out there in, in Nebraska, and he writes in his diary, you know, saw flying saucer, and then under hypnosis, turned out that he was taken aboard and informed of their intentions Barney and Betty Hill I mean these were the these were the key cases Shermer Bar Benny and uh, Barney and Betty Hill the Pascagoula incident um, uh, Travis Walton um, now there are hundreds of cases like this 
And I think that because it's in the consciousness, because we have, you know, a, a poll saying basically half of the world believes and half doesn't, um, we, we are, we, we're reaching a point where, as, as Stephen Bassett talks about his, his time clock, it's like the nuclear time clock uh, that we had in the 50s before we blew the world, you know, before we blew the world up. The theory that once the hands got to midnight, that's when all the nuclear weapons in the world would be discharged. Well, we've stopped that nuclear cl clock, thank thankfully. But as far as the UFO clock, he says we're, we're one minute to midnight now. Uh, meaning that in, in a minute to midnight, something really, really spectacular is going to happen. Now, whether that's a mass uh, appearance, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, it come over to the Yankee Stadium during a game. I think the next, possibly the next, maybe even in the next five years, we're going to uh, have um, occasions uh, like the one I experienced in upstate New York in the mid-80s when I was, I woke up in the middle of the night and I said to my wife, they're calling me, they're calling me, I want to go outside, they want me to come outside and see, you can woo-hoo, woo-hoo. Something outside wants me to come out and say, oh, just go back to bed. I went back to bed, but in the next day in the media, in newspapers, in radio, all over upstate New York and Ontario and Quebec and Vermont, people spoke about this urge they had to go out of their houses at 3 in the morning and look up into the sky. And 12,000 people shared this urge, and they went out, and it was a big, big news story. And, of course, the Air Force said that a Chinese rocket had exploded over New York State, and what people saw was a massive miles high pink spiral in the sky above the Great Lakes. Um, in Hull, Quebec, Canada, uh, a few years afterwards, uh, there was a story of several hundred people, almost a thousand people in this uh, community, Gatineau, uh, north of Hull, Quebec, Canada, in the, in the Quebec province, sharing this urge to come outside and look up into the sky, and they also saw an apparition. So there are going to be more of these uh, these mass sightings and um, you know the day that a million people in Idaho at a rock concert or or something see it that is when you're going to really get the conventional uh, military uh, and police sitting down to say well it's time to throw the Brook Brookings Institution report out and uh, and lay it open to the people and let the people decide you know what m must be done in, in conference with 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 our state leaders There have been so many celebrities, I mean, like people like David Bowie and John Denver, many people who have been interested in UFOs, but also in the idea of going into space. Would you train and go on the space shuttle yourself and, and conduct investigations into UFOs? And if you did that and you took an oath that stated that if you did discover something out there, that you would not share it with the American public. And if you knew you had captured on videotape actual UFOs from the space shuttle, would you break that oath and share the truth with the American public? Um, well, I, you know, first of all, I'm claustrophobic, so I doubt I'll go up into space. But if I were to go up into space, I would have to say, look, you know, what we see up there and what we find, you know, we're just gonna we're, we're just gonna have to throw out that that law there's a law according to nasa's space act signed on july 29th 1958 section 102 paragraph c subparagraph a we read information obtained or developed by the administrator in the performance of his functions under this act shall be available for public inspection except information authorized or required by federal statute to be withheld and information classified to protect the national security would NASA consider contact with an extraterrestrial civilization a threat to national security? And if they did, would they classify it to protect the national security? So I would have to say, no, I couldn't agree to non-disclosure. I really couldn't if I saw something or photographed something. But I can see where other people, uh, you know, wanting to do the best for their country, wanting to serve their country in a legitimate way would, would, would say, yes, I, I will not disclose and uh, this is based on the Brookings Institution report from the late 50s which you know c Congress Commission which said that if the existence of UFOs were really re revealed to uh, the American populace the American populace would not be able to handle
They would defy church authority, police authority, military authority, governmental authority. Uh, they wouldn't go to work. Uh, they would uh, uh, sort of cast aside the mayors and governors and presidents and go, we want to talk directly to these, these beings. We feel uh, that these beings should, you know, have their case uh, put to us directly by, by them themselves. Uh, I think the American populace today is ready to handle um, the concept that what we live in, the four dimensions of height, length, width, and time, is not all there is. There are more dimensional realities. There are advanced beings with machines that can skip from dimension to dimension, from galaxy to galaxy, using the einstein rosen bridges, the wormholes. Um, and um, I think the American people, I think half of them know, and I think the other half, with the proper evidence, would be ready, would be ready to accept it. Uh, it's going to take a mass sighting for the U.S. government to, to finally say, look, we're going to come on side with France, Belgium, Mexico, Turkey, Iran, and we're going to tell the truth and we're going to, we're going to reveal what happened to Tom Mantell when he went up in his P-51, what happened in the Great Lakes when uh, I believe it was an F, uh, F-104, I believe, was scrambled over the Great Lakes in the, in the 60s, what happened to him, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think that, uh, that if you have that type of sighting, then there, there, there'll be no choice. Um, interdimensional travel. I mean, not just traveling through our dimension, but going into alternate dimension, dimensions, Dan. Um, uh, would you, and if you could, a spaceship arrives in your yard, and you know, you've, got, you've got the barbecue out, and there's the uh, steak on the grill, and, and they want you right now, to come with them and go into another dimension and to move forward and backwards on the timeline to go forward in time and backward in time if you could move forward and backward in time are there any events in human history that you would interfere with that you would change to alter the destiny and the course of humanity well I wouldn't want to go back in time and change anything because uh, that would be a tampering that I, I wouldn't serve mankind well. Although there are many horrors, of course, wouldn't you have loved to have caught Hitler uh, as a 15-year-old and have him drown in a river? Um, or, um, you know, uh, because then we could have solved the Holocaust problem and then World War II may not have... Well, look, there were two guys. There was Otto Dinkel. You ever heard of him? Well, he was an orator hired by the German army, just like Hitler was, to speak. If Hitler died, maybe Otto Dinkel would have been the guy that would have gone on with this rabid anti-Semitism and wiped out nine million people. Um, of course one thinks of those things, but you don't want to go back in time and play with events because, you know, where we've come to today and the improvements we've made uh, in, 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 uh, in human rights and in regarding ourselves uh, as sacred, they've come because of the bad things that have happened. Now, if I went into the future, um, I would want to see where this planet is 300 years from now. Did we make it? Did we make it? That's what I would, I would like to know. I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence rather than the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, interdimensionality, again, if you could move forward and backward in time and meet any personality, any public figure, celebrity, or politician, or, or mystical figure, um, is there anybody that you would like to sit down with? If, if you could have lunch with them or, or just sit down and, and talk to them and, and have a discussion forward and backward in time. Oh, I'd love to spend an afternoon with Richard Feynman. Um, would love to sit down with Heisenberg and, uh, of course, you know, Einstein, Niels Bohr, Max Planck. Uh, you know, I'd love to sit with the, you know, the particular, uh, you know, the quantum physics guys. Because there really is, is the root of understanding how and why uh, the world is the way it is and the, 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 just the, the, the joy of these studies in antimatter that are occurring. Uh, everyone you picked is a physicist, a scientist, and 
I often think about how spirituality and science are merging, how they're kind of coming together. I mean, what ancient civilizations thought of as, of a universe was really the Earth and the Sun and a few planets. And now with the advent of the Hubble telescope, we can see that the universe is far bigger than the ancients had ever imagined. So while science and religion are merging on some ideas and other areas are just far off. But to make matters even more complicated, the idea of parallel dimensions or parallel universes, I mean, it's just getting so vast out there. Uh, how do you map a, a multiverse? You know, I've talked to some guys, they say that that, that fifth dimension, sixth dimension, could be right here by my ear and could be a millimeter wide and a millimeter across. You don't, you know, because you're talking about, you know, dimensions that defy any kind of dimensional understanding. And, um, you know, there was a, a, I forget his name, he died recently, in the last two years, but his, he proposed that, that there, there are parallel realities just because of the way we, we go through time. Like, here we are in this interview right now. Well, what I said and what you said and what we, we all did two minutes ago still exists somewhere because it, we just did it. It's there. It's like a wake we've left. And, uh, and if you had a time vehicle, you could go back to two minutes before and, and stop and, and see what we're doing two minutes before. You go back to your high school days. You go back to your days as an infant. Uh, and those realities are still existing alongside what, what we're progressing through. Um, you know, it's, it's all a beautiful, beautiful mystery. I am here because I am a, a writer, a performer. I find it entertaining. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I, uh, you know, and I'm not a theosopher or philosopher. And I, I, you know, I am just here because it is enormously, enormously entertaining. And mysteries like this are challenging. And it's really, really fun to contemplate uh, that, uh, you know, there, there may be beings out there who are concerned about our planet and who may give us the opportunity to advance ourselves. It's, it's really fun to contemplate. All the physics that we know on this planet, quantum physics uh, and, uh, and conventional physics and, and metallurgy and, and uh, you, know, you know, all of it, it can, it can really encompass a theory of how these ships move. I mean, you've, you've done it yourself, David, uh, proposing, you know, that when, if you can convert, you know, a mass to a, a state of, you know, of photonic energy, then there is no... Uh, there is no mass anymore, and you're, you're looking at pure light, you're looking at anti-gravity, you're looking at uh, something that can be, you know, uh, harnessed in waves. Well, what is the fuel? Well, people, you know, Bob Lazar talked about, you know, this element 115 uh, that was put into uh, these generators uh, to boil mercury and uh, to be used as gravity tractors. Maybe, maybe that's it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, they must be using a fuel that, that's unavailable to us is it, is it does it does it give off radioactive waste what is the cost to them for instance the venice ufo that you recently showed me and and i love i covet that tape that's amazing uh, because you see the metallic quality of the object you see the force field around it you see it spinning it was uh may 2nd uh 2004 approximately 11 30 a.m and uh, i was walking from my apartment with my girlfriend down this alley right here and we were just sort of walking this way and I looked up uh, over at those phone lines and we saw something that we really couldn't make sense of. It was a uh, very shiny, you know, uh, metallic disc. So we turned the corner here and uh, this is basically where we're just looking at it. And uh, we're pretty much like, uh, okay, that's uh, not a balloon or anything we're familiar with. So uh, we sort of kept walking to the corner and just, uh, stared at it for a while and, until it hit me uh, you know that this was really something there was a man uh, also looking at it uh, sort of a bystander and he said uh, wow uh, do you guys see that and that's when I realized all three of us were looking at something extraordinary well, what is the environmental cost of running these machines are they clean or are they not is there some wherever you know they came from is there some 
place they have to go back to after their journeys are finished to dump whatever uh, they've used up in terms of fuel like we would an, a, a bad fuel rod in a reactor. Um, that, that is a, is a question I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to ask is, you know, is you, are you a clean burning uh, vessel or is there some cost that, that you pay like we paid for atomic energy? When we consider that it may be possible to take mass and, and reduce it down to zero, make it as light as a photon, um, we can start to uh, approach this whole light speed phenomena from a whole new direction. I mean, we're going to be able to do this. This is, this is the only logical answer. There are no visible nuclear materials in the universe as we know it to produce the kind of energies in a steady stream that you need to get mass up to that speed. There are no visible nuclear fuels that can produce one trillion electron volts all day long. And, let's, and wormholes. Wormholes are even more exotic. The idea of you know, bending and folding two sp spaces of space-time together and creating a shortcut wormhole to vector in between those two points. Uh, according to Kip Thorne, who wrote uh, Black Holes and, and Time Warps, that the energy required for a wormhole is a hundred million suns, the energy, the negative energy they put out for an entire year. There are a hundred million suns in our galaxy alone. That means all of the negative solar energy coming from our suns in this whole galaxy, the total energy for a whole year is required to create a wormhole. Where, is, where has any extraterrestrial civilization or our civilization going to get access to levels of energy that high? It's never going to happen. That's why I've reversed the table here. I said, you know, you have to ultimately get frustrated with the idea of increasing energy on mass. You, you have to just, it's like banging your head against the wall and trying to cram it through the wall. You will never be able to do it this way. So the new way, as I propose, is to make this all possible. And when you consider UFOs coming in, stopping on a dime, and then accelerating and turning out into space, any Air Force pilot can tell you that stopping on a dime the G-forces are going to throw you right through the walls. Yeah, you'll be crushed. And then sudden acceleration mm -hmm. is going to do the same thing. It's going to destroy mm -hmm. the body of the pilot. So this, this new approach and this new idea, I mean, it, this is just the inception. It's just the beginning. But um, I think this is really the only w avenue that we can look down right now and the only way we can see uh, solving this problem. While Gordon Cooper was an Air Force pilot stationed in Munich, Germany in 1951 in the 86th Fighter Bomber Group where he flew F-84s and F-86s, Cooper testifies to having chased disc-shaped UFOs that outmaneuvered the most advanced fighter jets of our time. We were flying in Germany and we were flying F-86s and they would come over and do the same maneuvers that we make, except every once in a while one of them would go zip. And you just can't do that in a fighter, a conventional fighter. They're just typical uh, saucer shape, double lenticular shape, metallic looking. Well, yeah, they weren't just random. They were flying. Uh, they were flying fighter formations, very definitely under positive control. I'm here to announce that the second annual Exopolitics Expo, X Conference 2005, was concluded on Sunday, April 24th. This event was produced by Paradigm Research Group. 26 speakers and panelists presented to 450 attendees over three days. It was a unique event which focuses on the political, governmental, and social implications of extraterrestrial related phenomena. It is produced by PRG as part of the emerging activist movement seeking to end a government imposed truth embargo regarding extraterrestrial related phenomena. Uh, do you believe, um, and, and describe, you know, do you believe that your show was shut down um, for national security reasons? And, and tell, us, tell us a little bit about what happened with the show out there.
Well, what happened was we, we, we sold the show to, uh, to Sci-Fi Channel, and uh, it was called Out There, and I basically interviewed all of the people that I admired uh, in various fields of study, like uh, Colin Andrews from the Crop Circle Movement, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, the expert on cattle mutilations, John Mack. Um, and let me just put a pin in things right there, because John Mack has taken the study of abductions, UFOs, right out through the other, uh, other side, and he's going, yes, we know they're here, we know they're coming, we know people have been taken, we know there's experimentation going on, we know people have been told about agendas. What we now have to do is use that as a key and as a motivation to socially transform this planet to a more peaceful, more loving, more tolerant state. So his movement, the, the movement for social change, has just accepts as a fact abductions, UFOs, interplanetary uh, 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 intervention, and what he's doing is taking it out through the positive side of it and saying, now we must use it to, to socially transform, and I think his message is great. But I talked to him, I talked to the Allagash guys who were taken in the canoe on that trip in Pennsylvania. I, um, I mean, and I, the last show, the last show we did, I had both Bassett, who uh, has the, the UFO time clock, and then Greer. Both Bassett and Greer were there. They were my two guests for the day. Well, the show was canceled that afternoon. And um, I was outside, in, before I knew it was canceled, in between the interviews. And uh, I was outside, and Britney Spears called me because she wanted to, me to appear on Saturday Night Live with her. And so I picked up, I was outside having a cigarette, the phone rang. Uh, I, I, oh, Brittany, how you doing? Oh, sure, of course I will. I turned away like this. I turned back, and there was a black Ford across the road, a black Ford sedan. And I, I was trying to look at the plate, and the plate seemed kind of like fuzzy, and I was, you know, definitely a police car. And two guys were there, and a big, big, tall guy got out of the back seat, and he stood in the street on, um, on 42nd Street, it was. We, we were at 42nd Street and 8th Avenue, and he looked right at me. And literally, I mean, I was on the phone, hey, oh, sure, of course I'd love the show. Saw the Ford, went back like this, turned back like a half second later, and it was gone. And that car did not go past me. It did not make a U-turn, because I would have seen 42nd Street. I would have seen that thing take a U-turn and go away. That car vanished. That car was a cloaked vehicle of some type. And whether this was like a warning to me, because the guy cut out of the back seat, gave me a real dirty look. That car vanished. I know what I saw. And... Uh, you know, I, I, it, was, it was just this fast. It was, oh, hi, Brittany, sure. Oh, of course, I'd love to. Do. God gives me a dirty look. Oh, well, sure. Car gone. That's what happened. And uh, then two hours later, uh, we were told we were not to continue taping, and the show was canceled, and none of them would air. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Was that, uh, was that an MIB experience? You know, black helicopters, uh, you know, military... Uh, abductions that happen sometimes people are taken and they talk about then being visited by you know military personnel and re debriefed about their abduction was it you know was it a technology associated with some of these beings that are visiting that wanted to warn me off or that wanted to give me verification that I was on the right track I don't know but I do know I I did I did turn back a second later and I you know it takes so long for an automobile accelerating from zero to 40 miles an hour to reach the corner of 8th Avenue and 42nd Street going past me and then pulling a U-turn and going out towards Times Square, I would have seen that car. And I looked around. I mean, I, I was looking for that then. It was gone. So, um, I, I don't know. The tapes exist. I have them. We're going to try to repackage them. We might put them out on DVD. I was having some cameramen film the installation of a, of a precision landing facility we were putting in right on the edge of the dry lake. And this saucer flew right over them and put down three little gear and landed out on the dry lake bed. And they went out to, uh, <coughs> picked up their cameras and moved on out toward him filming. And he lifted off, put the gear back in the well, and, climbed out at a very high rate of speed and disappeared.
And so while I was uh, going through all the regulation books and finding out the number to call in Washington to report it, uh, I had them go over and develop the film. By the time they got back with the developed film, I was on the higher and higher and higher <coughs> level officer talking to me. Finally, with the colonel telling me to, uh, you know, when the film arrived at my desk to put it in the carrier pouch, there would be a courier there at my office by that time already, and, and they'd arrange for him to fly in our base airplane back to Washington with these films and uh, do not run prints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't have a chance to run it. I had a chance to hold it up to the window and look at it. It was certainly good film. Well, by this time, I was involved in the research and development and doing very classified programs myself, you know, at the test center. So I knew that we didn't have any vehicles of that kind, and I was 99, 9 tenths percent sure that the Russians didn't have any of that type either. So it certainly, there were certainly was, at that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was uh, made at some other place than here on Earth. And yeah, well, Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon coming true. <laughs> Dude, I got it, man. Probably moved a hundred miles in a matter of a second or two. In July of 19, uh, July, excuse me, 2002, right here in the Washington, D.C. area, there was yet again a airspace jet chase by two F-16 jet interceptors charged, uh, which were chasing a bluish object right outside D.C. In fact, we have one of the key eyewitnesses here in this room today. This received some play in the Washington Post and a little bit of mainstream media, then of course fell into the black hole of the media, never to be discussed again. What were these objects that were able to outperform F-16 interceptors in a post-9-11 America? What is going on? And what are the consequences, or the potential consequences, in the event that we should shoot down a few of them? A related question that I have been asking myself is to what extent are they really an enemy? What crimes have they committed against humanity? They have certainly upset the military by flying over their most secret installations, by shadowing their planes, and by buzzing their astronauts. The Army shot 1,430 rounds of anti-aircraft fire at the UFO between 3.12 and 4.15 a.m. Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall wrote a top-secret memo to President Franklin D. Roosevelt that the U.S. Navy recovered an unidentified craft off the coast of California. The retrieved craft was in fact not earthly and in all probability of interplanetary origin. I mean, to me, what this is all about is not just, you know, looking up in the sky and saying, you know, wow, there's another UFO, yet another sighting. I mean, it's about exploring the phenomena. We have to get past denial. I mean, everyone is stuck at denial. I mean, it, mainstream science says the phenomena is not happening, and they don't take it seriously, and they try to sweep with them half the world. But over 50% of the American population, according to polls, believe in the UFO phenomena and, and the government just buries it. Well, there's some media that are, that are guilty of, of trying to suppress and, and, and there are some media that are just throwing the story out there. Now, this Mexican sighting, we had coverage on Fox, we had coverage on CNN, and in the Daily News in the Valley here, we had a front page article, you know, with the, with the, with the pictures and UFO, big question mark, and I mean, they were treating it. I think increasingly now, the media has to take into account that this is a reality. And I think, again, to look, go along with the theory and the feeling that John Mack has, we, 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 you know, let's get past the debate whether they're here or not. Yeah. Let's start to analyze 
who they are, how many of them are there, what kind of systems they're using, what their intentions are to us here on their planet, and can we utilize uh, this knowledge to better ourselves as a species. With the advent of the Hubble telescope, I mean, when you see how big it really is out there, and the idea that we're stuck on this myopic little ball, we're just glued to it, we can't get our eyes off of it. It's more, it's more of a mystery now than it ever has been um, why we're, we're stuck here. And there's got to be a way to decode the matrix and finding out how these craft work, you know, how we can, can get out into the universe ourselves. I mean, I think that's what this is really all about. It's not about trying to prove it whether it's right or wrong. It's trying to, it's like when the, the first time man saw a bird fly. Well, uh, the last UFO symposium conducted by MUFON, they sent me the book of the speakers. There, are, there were many, many scientific people in there, many astrophysicists, celestial mechanics experts, uh, metallurgists, you know, people who've been consulted on these cases over the years. No, I mean, when you have John Callahan, an F ex-FAA supervisor, saying, yep, they're real, when you have John Schuschler, who was a, uh, a Boeing engineer, uh, now running uh, MUFON, uh, and saying, yep, you know, they're real. When you have, uh, you know, pilots uh, and, 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 and per personnel in the police and military coming forward in the Rockefeller Report and in the Disclosure Report saying uh, they're real. When you have a Belgian general on television showing you a tape from a fighter uh, which is filming uh, an, an object escaping at high speed, when you have this Mexican case, uh, you know, I think we can pretty well put it to bed and say, yep, they're here, they're doing things to us, with us, interacting with us. Whether we've had, you know, official military contact, again, that goes into the black box area, uh, but there should be no debate anymore. UFOs exist, they are intelli intelligently manufactured and guided uh, technology from somewhere else, not, not this planet. While human beings can only see from red to violet wavelengths of light, the infrared and ultraviolet spectrums are invisible to humans. I quickly learned that NASA uses special video cameras that are capable of seeing into these invisible spectra. The tether has broken and is going away from it. Get it on the TV, Claude. Please get it on the TV. After the 12 mile long tether snaps, several days later on an orbital pass, the cameras find something that should not be there. In the NASA STS-75 tether incident of March 1996, we find NASA using ultraviolet light sensitive video cameras. This is where some of the largest UFOs ever caught on videotape have been captured. Huge dish shaped luminous UFOs swarm the tether. We know the tether is 77 to 100 miles away from the cameras on the shuttle. The UFOs pass behind the 12 mile long tether. So we can therefore use the 12 mile length of the tether to measure their minimum diameters. Some measure between 1 and 3 miles wide, making them literally motherships. In Project Blue Book files, UFOs with these same features have been reported several times as shiny metallic disks with dark centers. Specifically, in the invisible infrared, Trevor James Constable, a retired World War II radar operator from New Zealand, has photographed many UFOs with the same features, translucent disks of light with dark centers. facing our planet today. 
So how do people respond to Dan Aykroyd when he talks to them on a personal level about UFOs? You know what? It's, it's, it's interesting. When I talk to people, well, first of all, people ask me about it. They, they come to me and they say, oh, I, you know, we, we saw an interview, we heard an interview, uh, they heard the thing on Art Bell that we did. Uh, they come to me and ask me about it. So it's not like I have to go out there and crusade and, and say, hey, did you hear about the latest Mexican case? They, they've seen CNN, they've seen Fox, they've seen the Daily News. They come to me and ask me about it, and I basically lay out, you know, my thoughts on it. I'd say half the people that I speak to about this have either seen themselves, heard about it from a credible, credible witness, or are willing to, to accept. The other half, t totally not. Harold Ramis, my good friend and collaborator, does not believe, will not accept until, you know, proof, hard proof is presented to him in the form of, you know, something tangible. And uh, so uh, what, I, what I've been able to do is just open people's minds a little bit and, uh, and, and let them think about it. And, of course, the greatest proof are, are the kinds of tapes that now exist, the kind of videos that, that exist. Um, and uh, usually when I, when I show some tape uh, of some different things that have been exposed to me, well, that, it's pretty convincing. And then at that point, uh, people have to go away and, and accept that, you know, that, the, that these things are, are, are a part of our, our reality. Well, what I'd like to, you know, what, I'd, what we'd all like to affect is, is some positive change in the world and try to help the, the tipping point where, where good tips to, to overflow evil in the world. I mean, you know, we know there's good and bad out there, yin, yang, black, white. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are, are, you know, tremendous this tremendous divisiveness in the planet and you know perhaps this study and this this understanding of things that are greater than we have accomplished technologically uh, will lead us to a spiritual awakening uh, one that helps us respect other beings out there in the universe and other dimensions and also in our own uh, four dimensions and here in the physical world that we live in the sacredness of human life uh, the willingness to get along a little better, to relinquish materialism and territoriality in favor of a more um, comprehensive uh, worldview which, uh, in which we unite and we all feel the energy uh, within us uh, as, as part, of a, uh, part of a universal light. Um, God, God, I thank you, Dan, so much for this interview. I'm very grateful. I really believe you're one of the greatest minds in our world at this time. Thank you so much.